Welcome to the Cooking for Chemo podcast. I'm Chef Ryan, the host. And I'm the producer, Jesse Callahan. The purpose of this podcast is to tackle the eating-related side effects of chemotherapy and discuss practical, real-world solutions to make your food taste great again. That's right, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, in this podcast, like she said, we're going to tackle these real-world solutions, and we're going to have some fun, we're going to talk, we're going to tell jokes, we're going to be silly. This is an, not just a functional educational podcast, this is a fun, entertaining podcast, and I want everybody to feel good, and we're going to take your questions. And hopefully you'll want to listen to it over and over and over again and share with all your friends. Exactly. <laughs> so this is our very first episode, and it's going to be all about cooking for chemo. What is cooking for chemo? Who we are? What we do? And we have our very first listener question that you get to answer, Chef Ryan. Yay. <laughs> so let's just jump right into it. Chef Ryan, what is cooking for chemo? Explain to people listening. So if you've never heard of us, um, cooking for chemo is very simply, we are an organization that works with cancer patients, cancer fighters, caregivers, dietitians, oncologists, nursing staff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What we do is we very simply make your food taste great again. Uh, one of the things that happens with chemotherapy, a lot of us know that causes metallic taste and mouth sores, loss of appetite, you know, disinterest in food, things just smell weird, they taste bad. What the heck is even going on? This whole thing's a mess, right? Well, Cooking for Chemo is a comprehensive concept that teaches you how to understand why food tastes bad, and then secondarily, how to make it taste good again. And that's the idea. So what, what do you teach them that makes it taste good again? Like, is it cooking techniques? Is it just like, oh, make this egg over here and you're gonna like, <laughs> you're gonna like it? What makes, what, sure. what's the difference and, and why is it different than what's already out there? Okay, so what makes Cooking for Chemo different is instead of just saying, well, this is healthy, eat this, or this is healthy, eat that, that doesn't work for everybody. What Cooking for Chemo does is focuses on teaching you, the cancer fighter, how to understand what foods you like, what tastes good, what smells good, what makes you feel loved and wholesome and, and happy, and then helps you to make that food and prepare it in a way that you can eat. Because the goal of Cooking for Chemo is to fight cachexia, which is a fancy way of saying systematic starvation. And we want people to be able to eat and have that family time because those meals are so important. They're part of culture. They're part of life. They're part of everything. And what Cooking for Chemo does is we teach you how to understand what tastes good, what tastes bad, and to avoid the things you don't like and to eat the things you do like. Take the information from your oncology dietitian or your oncologist on what foods you should be eating with your type of cancer and then make them taste great for you to make you feel happy, loved, increase your quality of life, and of course, keep you from starving. So this is basically like the go-between. This is like a bridge that connects the cancer patient to what the dietitian is saying. Am I understanding this correctly? That is correct. That's exactly what we do at Cooking for Chemo is we, we are the bridge between the science and the art, you know? So the dietitian's over here saying, you need to eat more healthy, blah, 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 blah. And you're over here saying, but it all tastes bad. Ew, right. gross. And you come in the middle and say... Here, I could teach you how to make this taste great and you can eat it. Exactly. And that's and that's the idea. And and the first thing that I like to say in every cooking for chemo class and even in my books is everybody is different. No two people are the same. Every doctor knows this, every dietitian knows this, every oncologist knows this. Anyone who tells you that there is a one size fits all diet cure eating regimen or that food cures cancer is lying to you and trying to sell you something. And that is what we avoid here at Cooking for Chemo, like the plague. <laughs> Everyone's different. and Everyone's everyone, different. Everyone can eat different things and everyone... And that brings me to my first point, which is that comfort food is subjective. Comfort food is things that you eat when you're sick and you don't feel good. They make you feel better. For me, it's chicken noodle soup and hot and sour soup and pho from the Vietnamese restaurant. They're these soupy, brothy textures, right? But that's because of where I grew up from. It makes me feel loved, it feels it makes me feel comfortable. But if I grew up in India, my idea of comfort food would be different, or Japan, or in England, or France, or even Southern Africa. Any of these places, the food, the cuisine, the culture is different, and so what you would associate as being comfort food would also be different. And so we wanna think about that comfort food 
and what makes us feel happy. And that's a good place to start and finding the foods that we love to eat. So what is the story behind cooking for chemo? Like, why did you want to start this? Why did you do this? So cooking for chemo really comes from my experiences uh, as a caregiver with my mother. Uh, my mother was diagnosed with HER2 positive breast cancer. And I spent basically a year as her full-time live-in caregiver. I cooked three to six meals a day for her. I cooked, I cleaned, I paid the bills, I ran to the appointments, I took her to the, to the you know, the physical therapist, the, the, the lymphedema specialist. We had these reconstruction surgeries and all this stuff. And all the time, you know, we of course had to go in for chemotherapy in between all this. There was just a lot to do. So she needed somebody to help her out. This is, you know, cancer. People always think, oh, you're just going to lay back and be rested. It's no, it's a running around crazy kind of time. So basically I was running a restaurant with some family friends in Texas and I got the call from my mom saying, hey, Ryan, they found a lump. It's nothing serious, nothing to panic about. But here's what's going on. Here's our treatment plan. Here's the prognosis. They're just going to do a this and a that. Well, the single partial mastectomy turned into a, a double mastectomy, and which turned into reconstruction, and then a hysterectomy, and then six to eight months of uh, all these different chemo treatments, and then all the accessory drugs that go on for two or three years, and so on and so forth. It was a hot mess. And one of the things I knew going into this was... Um, from my experiences with both my grandfathers who had unfortunately passed away because of cancer and my best friend in college, Tommy, um, they all passed away. And the thing that they passed away from was not actually the cancer. It was complications from the chemotherapy treatments, which was what we now know is called cachexia, which is systematic starvation. And this systematic starvation, I'd watched it happen to three people that I loved more than the, the entire universe. And when my, I heard my mom had cancer, I heard the C word and I flew. You and me, you remember, we packed up and mm -hmm. we got, we closed down the restaurant, we shut it down, we moved to take care of my mom and we spent a year doing it. And cooking for chemo really came from my experiences as a caregiver and cooking and trying to get her to eat things and trying all these different things and keeping these tasting journals and these logs of what she liked, what she didn't like, what worked, what didn't work, what cooking techniques increased her appetite, which ones diminished it, what foods worked, what food didn't. And that really turned into the system that we now call Cookie for Chemo, which is a series of <laughs> I'm trying to keep it keep it real simple. Yeah, because we're going to get into all we're the different all topics this. and other podcasts. A series podcasts. Of, of cooking techniques and food perception ideas to help you to understand what food is, what it tastes like, what it smells like, what it looks like, the entire eating experience, how it makes you feel, why you remember these things, why it makes you feel like this. And we're going to go into great detail on these subjects. So I'm trying not to get bogged down yes, too much. Yes, in, in different episodes. In different we're going to take, take each episode and explore each topic so it's easy for you to understand. So not to overwhelm everybody on the first episode, but basically it's based on my experiences working with my mom. Then we, I wrote an 18-page pamphlet that I was going to try to give to any cancer organization who'd republish it for free. And then Jesse, uh, the, the producer of this show, who is also the producer of everything else that we I do. I mean, I'm his wife. Right, clearly. <laughs> um, she does everything. She does all the back-end stuff. And she, looked, she read it, and she looked at me, and she goes, this needs to be a book for the average person. And that's where Cooking for Chemo and After, our award-winning cookbook, um, came from and that was published in 2015 and we've been working with cancer patients ever since and it is almost 2020 which will be the fifth year we've been doing cooking for chemo so was there nothing out there at the time in, in 2015 when you were helping your mom did you look for solutions outside of what you were already doing were you were you looking for any answers to the problems you were facing with the eating related side effects with your mom and did you and did you find anything that was helpful or is that why you made cooking for chemo so literally you kind of already answered the question you kind of <laughs> led me to led the horse to water and beat it with a stick um <laughs> sorry <laughs> we wrote cooking for chemo because there was nothing else there was nothing else that worked there was nobody else who had a comprehensive system who understood why the side effects were happening how they came about what you could do for this it was just more or less People saying, eat this, not that, cook this, these nutrients are better for this, et cetera, et cetera, which doesn't help the average everyday patient. When you have a little tiny pamphlet that says use a plastic spoon instead of a metal spoon, that doesn't tell you why it's not you should helpful. use that. It's not even helpful no. at all. And that's where cooking for chemo came from is there was nothing. There needed to be something. And we've updated it three times now to make it the best possible guide 
available. Well, the thing that I think is great too about cooking for chemo is is not you you don't only learn the how to make your food taste good, you also learn why you need to be doing this and and why we're why you have these methods and uh, you know um, things that people do. Because once you learn why you're doing something, you remember how to do it, and then you can take that information and apply it to other things. And, and that's something that I think is so great about this as well. And I agree. And that's, and that's what my focus has been in culinary education and teaching people is, do, I don't want you to just repeat the same recipe over and over and over again. I want you to understand why something tastes spicy, why something tastes sweet, why you like the taste of savory foods, why you crave a buffalo chicken wing or White Castle sliders or whatever it is that you <laughs> crave. I want you to be able to understand what the reason for this, why your body generates this craving, why you have this association, what you like and what you don't like so that you, then you're not, I don't want you to just go and make my chicken and dumplings recipe 400 times and know the recipe forwards and backwards. I want you to know why it tastes this way, how to make it your own, and I want you to use my recipes as a skeleton, not the uh, the skeleton to build your own recipe, to express your own creativity and your own art, because cooking is science and it is art, but it is also so much of the human experience. And that is the goal. And that's what we want to do with this. Well, that's great because, you know, you like things a little more salty than I do. I that's... like them a little less salty. And these days I really, I'm loving sour flavors. And I know we're going to get into this in a different episode, but... Um, that's great because then you can make it your own. Exactly. And no two people like the same things. It's, it's just the truth of the matter. We're going to get into how everyone's different and what preferences are and how they're a byproduct of who you are, where you're from, and your experiences later in the show. Um, and how to tweak them for your own personal preferences. Exactly. Well. And so, like I said, there is no one size fits all solution. There's not a hat I can give you that you can wear that's going to fix everything. This is a learning process. It's fun. It's going to be funny. It's going to be educational. <laughs> uh, you can get the cookbook, Cooking for Chemo and After, on our website, cookingforchemo.org. Got to do the little plug there. Yes, great job. So I'm going to move us forward and wrap this up. Why do we do... You kind of already answered this, like, by inferring the answer to this. But I want you to come out and just answer it straight why do you do what you do? Why do we do cooking for chemo? <laughs> why, 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 why? Just like we need to understand why we eat, what we eat, why do we do cooking for chemo? We do cooking for chemo because people are literally starving to death. Uh, I know that in cancer lately, the, the word is to avoid the D word or anything that involves that idea because, you know, it, it happens. But it's the truth of the matter. Cachexia causes people to die. It just does. You starve literally to death. It is it is unbelievable. Um, the statistics are just unbelievable that 20 to 40% of non-terminal cancer patients who unfortunately pass away do so because of cachexia, which is starvation, not because of uh, the cancer itself. And then terminal patients, that figure can be as high as 75% according to some recent cachexia studies. And that's just unacceptable. This is this is 2019, about to be 2020. This is an unacceptable solution. People have no business starving in this day and age. And it's very simply, we do this because there is an easy solution. It takes dedication, but you can do it. It's just like losing weight or lo learning to paint or learning a new skill. You're learning how to cook. You're learning how to understand food. And there is no excuse, once you have this information, to not do it and not adjust it for yourself. And so that is plain and simply, why we do cooking for chemo is very plain and simply to save people's lives and give them that quality of life back that they're missing. And you that's why we do it. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I didn't have to lead you to that one. <laughs> so, okay, um, let's go ahead and jump to our last topic of discussion, which is our, we got an email. Oh, and someone has a question, questions, kind of, and we're going to have you answer it. And so if you're listening to this podcast and you have a, sp a question that is specific to your situation, feel free to give us, shoot us an email or DM Ryan on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And what's our, what's your DM in our email? I don't know off the top of my head. What do you mean our email? What do, which one of those two things? Do, they're two different things. So our email is info at cookingforchemo.org. And my Instagram is at chef underscore Ryan underscore Callahan. 
Honestly, guys, just get online, Google Chef Ryan Callahan. You found me already. Just Google Chef Ryan Callahan. You'll find me. I'm not hard to get a hold of. Okay, so we're going to jump right to the question, and it says, Hi, Chef Ryan. I finished my chemo and uh, radiation therapy. Still not back at work. I used to love savory dishes, but I hate the smell now, especially onions. Bizarrely, cat food smells the same. We have five cats. I am still losing weight, though slower now. How can I improve my appetite, and will I ever get back to normal? Hope you can help. Thank you, Nick. Okay, so this is for Nick. Um, I'm just going to point out that Nick is from the UK because he put a U in savory. So this answer will be from an American perspective. I'm just going to preface everyone on that. Um, so typically what happens is... During chemotherapy, your sense of smell, your sense of taste, and what we call memory and association become disaligned. And so the, the example I always use is, it's like you went to go bite into a donut. Like, let's say you bit into a chocolate donut, and instead it tasted like a Big Mac, right? You've got, you've got this beefy, greasy, cheesy flavor all of a sudden in this donut. You're going to be kind of freaked out, right? And that's what is happening after and during chemo, is your... What you expect something to taste like and what it tastes like now have become disaligned. And because of this disalignment, what, what very simply happens is you expect it to taste like this, but it tastes like something completely different now. And so what we have to do is we have to relearn our preferences and relearn what foods taste good to us and what foods taste bad and give ourselves the opportunity to say, no, I don't like this. Yes, I like this. And be a little picky for a while until you relearn what you like. Another example of this is, like you said, a savory dish. So let's use an example of a shepherd's pie, okay? So you bite into a, savory, a shepherd's pie, it's super savory, it's got all the veggies, it's got the brown gravy, it's got the potatoes. But if it tastes like a Greek salad all of a sudden, or what you remember a Greek salad tastes like, light, fresh, and citrusy, right? All of a sudden you're gonna be like, whoa, what is this weird flavor in my mouth? This is another example of the flavor expectation, what we remember it to taste like, and what, it, what we perceive it now, the taste, the smell, and the sight, the current information, they're not matching up. It's like if you try to put a DVD in a CD-ROM drive. It's just not going to work, right? So that's what we have to do. So my advice to you, Nick, um, before we get too far into this, would be to sit down and do what I call the smell game. And it's on, it's on our website, cookieforchemo.org. You can go through why do things taste weird. And what you do is you basically taste and smell everything in your house. Just start there. Go to an all-you-can-eat buffet. Whatever you want to do. Try a couple of different dishes every day. You know, just try this. Try the smell of this. And keep a little journal. We call it a tasting journal. You can go to the website. Now, the printable resources, there's a tasting journal page. You can print out as many of those as you want at home. Okay? And you just keep a log of what it tastes like, what you ate, what it smelled like, how did it make you feel, did you like it, did you not like it, would you like it with something else? And just start by smelling household objects, start by tasting things in your kitchen, then move out to different restaurants, all you can eat buffets, things like that, and try these different things and see and find the strategy that works for you to find the pattern. So is it really savory dishes? Is it what kind of savory? Savory could be a thousand different things, right? There's literally an herb called savory, right? So it's 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 not a specific category, okay? Is it savory Indian dishes? Is it savory Chinese dishes? Is it Japanese? Is it American? Is it continental? Is it British? Is it lamb? And we're going to dive into this topic exactly. a lot more in another episode as right. well. So, so Nick, that's, that's, the, that's the solution. Start by going through and tasting everything and keeping a log and understanding what it tastes like, what it smells like, and do you like it or do you not like it? And that'll give you a map. And start with, it's like a ripple in a pond. You throw a pebble in and you start with a small a small ripple, right? But as it goes out, it becomes easier and wider. So you start with things and then you find the things you like. And then if you like beef, but you don't like pork, all of a sudden, you know, okay, well, let's stick to the beef. Okay, so then we can try some chicken. Okay, I don't like chicken. Let's stay on the beef route. It's because of this savory, this flavor, this characteristic. And that is how you start to eat and gain weight. And of course, as I always say, it's all about that one extra bite, right? If, you, if you, you're full, just try to get one or two extra bites every meal and that'll help you get those extra calories and start putting that weight back on. So that's all for this episode of the Cooking for Chemo podcast. Remember, you can get all of this information and more on our website, cookingforchemo.org, along with our award-winning cookbook, 
cooking for chemo and after. I'm the producer, Jesse Callahan. And I'm Chef Ryan Callahan. Thanks for listening.